right, let me have your attention while Miss while Miss Kathy is in here. Uh, I'm going to begin to pass this uh, to pass our our roll sheet around. Most like 90% of you can just check. Yes, I'm here. Uh, if if we don't have your name, there's some blank spots at the bottom. Ms. Kathy said some of you had messy handwriting, and if it's not on your list, you were here last week, maybe try to write a little bit better. Does, uh, does everybody have a booklet? Okay, if you were not here last time, you need a whole booklet. You can raise your hand. If you brought your booklet back, you have insert sheets. Now, uh... Last last time, we walked through uh, the story of worship, and you had a chart, and I was supposed to fill out a chart on the board, but I did too fast the talking and not enough writing, and so when I got done, a lot of people were, were like taking pictures of my screen chicken scratch board and, and I felt sorry for you so I went and produced the whole sheet for you right here all right so you can uh, 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 you can you can keep keep your notes but this this is it filled out with all your references okay and then um, I did the same for this week uh, in that I, I gave you uh, charts that are filled out, okay, and uh, a map that we're going to draw and fill out together. Uh, the reason for that, I don't even know where I put those up. The reason for that is because... Um, we're going to move really fast tonight. I always move really fast. You need a whole brand new book. That's Miss Kathy. Is that we're going to move really fast tonight, and I have tried to give you all the notes that I think you will need so that more than anything, I just want your eyeballs up here, and we'll walk through it together. Uh, this is also being video recorded. I guess I can't stand in front of the camera. Uh, and so we'll have access to it. That way, I want you to be free to just walk through the material together. I have a lot of things for you. I promise you, you want to go home and, and chew on uh, what I'm showing and the charts that I'm giving you and some of that stuff. Okay? So, let's pray. Uh, then I'll, I'll reset the evening uh, um, where we were last time and, and where we are tonight, and then we'll get started, okay? All the logistics taken care of. Does, did you get a book left? I don't think there's one left. Oh, okay. There's got to be. Anyways, all right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, and what a joy it is to, uh, to think about your word we want to think well and rightly about it. We submit to your word. It is how you have revealed yourself to us through history, through concrete history, but recorded narratives so that we would know and understand who you are and all that you have done and are doing for us. Uh, and so teach us this evening. Uh, Father, please help me. Give me strength and the ability to communicate with clarity. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, uh, so I did a pivot uh, because I found out I had an extra week. All right, so I got back last time and uh, found out I have an extra week to, uh, to teach. And today's lesson is that extra week, okay? Uh, you will probably feel like we're drinking from a fire hose. And that's okay, all right? Um, here's why. This, is, this, this class is on spiritual disciplines, and the first four sessions that we're going to look at are on how to read your Bible, okay? Next session, I promise you, we're going to get real practical. I'm going to teach you important questions that we want to look at after you read your Bible, how to journal, and then the session after that, we're going to talk about memorizing Scripture, putting it in action, all of those type things. But I introduced last time with uh, 
with reading Ezekiel chapter 1 and then said, hey, you've, you've got a brand new believer sitting next to you. How do you interpret this? What's going on? Uh, and we began to talk about that there are certain sections of the Bible that are very difficult to interpret. There's a lot of different genres going on. Uh, there are a lot of moving parts. And more than anything, knowing where you are in the major storylines and themes of the Bible becomes paramount. Okay, And so with worship, I gave you the chart. We move from Old Testament categories of worship where God gets really specific in detail. All right, so now you can be reading in Leviticus, and God is super specific about what the priest is supposed to wear and why they have to have uh, all, all the, the jewels on his chest and all that other stuff, but you can know where that's going. The priesthood ultimately fulfilled in Christ, and ultimately now we are priests underneath the high priest, right? You can see the trajectory. So, uh, again, I'm trying to give you large categories in order to be able to interpret the scripture, okay? So tonight, the category I want to give you is what I'm calling the story of the Exodus, okay? The story of the Exodus. That is, here's what I'm saying to you. You cannot properly understand and read your Bible unless you understand the Exodus story. Okay? The Exodus becomes the primary salvation event of the Old Testament. And it gets repeated, and ultimately it becomes God's, uh, the, uh, an ultimate story about how we are saved. Okay? Uh, I want to show you a quick video to tease us and to get us uh, off on the right foot. Hopefully the volume's good. is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative in which every story, every character points beyond itself to one who is greater. The story of Adam and Eve is not just about the first man and woman. There is a true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden and whose obedience is ascribed to us. There is a true and better Abel who, though innocently slain, has blood that cries out, not for our condemnation, but for our acquittal. There is a true and better Abraham who answered the call of God to leave all the comfortable and familiar and go out into the void to create a new people of God. There is a true and better Isaac, the son of laughter, of grace, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us all. There is a true and better Jacob, who wrestled and took the blow of justice we deserve. So we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace that wake us up and discipline us. There is a true and better Joseph, who at the right hand of the king forgives those who betrayed and sold him and uses his new power to save them. There is a true and better Moses who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. There is a true and better rock of Moses who struck with the rod of God's justice now gives us water in the desert. There is a true and better Job, the truly innocent sufferer who then intercedes for and saves his foolish friends. There is a true and better David whose victory becomes his people's victory though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. There is a true and better Esther who didn't just risk losing an earthly palace but lost the ultimate heavenly one who didn't just risk his life but gave his life to save his people. There is a true and better Jonah who was cast out into the storm so that we could be brought in. There is a true and better Passover lamb, innocent, perfect, helpless, slain so the angel of death will pass over us. He's the true temple, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light, and the true bread. The Bible is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative that points 
the one person, Jesus. Okay, that's what we're going to accomplish tonight. And here's what I'm telling you from the beginning. In the Exodus narrative, that the entire Bible is one large theme story of the Exodus. And it goes like this. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you the ending, and then we'll, we'll get back there uh, when we finish tonight. And that is that uh, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the land, out of paradise, uh, because of their sin, and they were exiled. And because they were exiled because of their sin, and they were spiritually separated from God, uh, there, there has... A question that has loomed throughout the entire Bible, and that is, is there ever coming one like Moses who can bring the people out of exile and back into the promised land? Is there one who can come and redeem us and bring us back spiritually to our paradise, our Eden, ultimately, that we call heaven? Okay? This, this is the overall narrative of the Bible that I'm about to show you in repeated patterns, patterns that happen over and over again. The patterns sometimes vary. They do not vary that far from side to side. They sometimes vary in order. The reason that they vary is because they are actual historical events. And they are not repeated in trite ways that make it like, oh, we're just doing the same thing all the time. Okay? Uh, so with that said, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the Exodus account. Uh, many of you in here may know it readily. Uh, you have uh, most everything I'm about to draw on the board on your handy-dandy map that Robbie and I have been working on. Okay? So you have that there. I want your attention up here. Okay? You have all these notes. Again, it's recorded. Let's begin. Let's begin to walk through. The overall story of the Exodus goes like this. Uh, Israel, Jacob, and his family are in the promised land. And Jacob, uh, sorry, Joseph... Uh, one of the sons begins to have dreams and the brothers despise him because of those dreams and sell him into slavery and he goes to Egypt. Fast forward in the story and uh, Jacob's family, Israel, as a people are forced to come to Egypt because of a famine. There they find Joseph. Joseph ends up being the hero. He saves the day. They remain in Egypt, but after one iteration of the next Pharaoh, the Pharaoh does not know who they are. because, And because they are fruitful and multiplying and filling the land abundantly, Pharaoh gets scared of them. And becomes an evil taskmaster over them, giving them hard labor. So they become enslaved. After 400 years, as promised to Abraham from the very beginning, uh, God hears the cries of his people and sends forward a rescuer. His name? Moses. Moses. And Moses is going to be our rescuer. There are a lot of important events and movements, peculiar events in the life of Moses. We won't cover them just yet. Uh, some of those will be referred to on your sheet. So Moses comes as the rescuer. When it is time, Moses goes before Pharaoh. And he says, listen, Yahweh says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, who the heck's Yahweh? And God begins to unfold ten plagues. Okay? <clears throat> ten plagues upon Egypt, all showing 
Yahweh's power dominance who he is when you read through the exodus accounts you hear this refrain god saying the whole world will know my name egypt is a superpower right they're going down and everyone will know my name because my name will go and the glory will go to the ends of the earth and you read through the exodus accounts and it says it over and over again i'm doing all of this i have hardened pharaoh's heart halfway through any normal person would have said just get out of here i have hardened pharaoh's heart so that the whole world will know my name all right the the last plague becomes a very important one and that is the passover it becomes uh it becomes an incredibly important one because that's the one that ultimately leads to uh, the Exodus. And, um, and as we will see, there are particular really important patterns that are tied to that. God is going to insist that Israel remembers the Passover, that they celebrate it every year. Okay. And so uh, Pharaoh finally, after the Passover, uh, with the... So, we, we relatively know the, the Passover story, right? Put the blood of the lamb because a death angel is coming. We'll see the blood of the lamb and we'll pass over. After that, uh, Israel has its salvation event out of Exodus through the parting of the Red Sea. Pharaoh, the evil overlord, follows them and God in his power uh completely wipes the entire Egyptian army out in the sea. Okay, Israel now in their route, uh, they go back or they go to uh, Mount Sinai where actually God had promised Moses at the very beginning, you guys will meet back here and you will worship at this mountain. This will be a sign for you. This is Exodus 3.12. Uh, God says, or, or Moses says, man, how do I know you're going to send me? And how do I know you're with me? And God says, you guys will worship back at this mountain. The burning bush is on Mount Sinai. They meet back there. Moses meets back there with all the people. He goes up the mountain and God gives them, God makes a covenant with them and gives them laws that they need to follow because God is holy and this is how he must be worshipped. We covered a lot of that last time. Okay, from there, they begin... And as they're wandering through the wilderness, okay, there are wilderness trials. And God uh, sustains them through miracles. Specifically, I'll refer to the manna. You guys remember manna? And what was the manna? <laughs> what is it? That's right. Uh, manna, this, this wafer-like bread substance just begins to appear on, on the ground in the morning. Why? Because they're going through the wilderness and they need to be fed. There is a light, a cloud that leads them by the day and turns to a pillar of fire at night that brings them warmth and protection. Uh, and then there's also, of course, if you're going through the desert, there's always this question about the water. And repeatedly, God provides water through them, even through Moses striking a rock and water coming out. Okay? Now, sad but true, they're going to end up spending 40 years in the wilderness. And their wilderness journeys, God continues to provide for them and sustains them through miracles Continuing with the manna, the light, and the water. Eventually, they come up and they enter in and they cross the Jordan. As they cross the Jordan here, uh, there is a similar pattern, water event, as they're crossing the Jordan. That parallels the event of the crossing the sea here. And... Uh, the first town that they go to is Jericho, and when in Jericho, there is a particular event with a harlot named Rahab that involves the putting of a red cord 
outside the door so that all of her family might get into so that her and anyone that she includes in there might be saved because their army is coming and they will destroy all outside of that. There is, so I hope you see already we have developed a short pattern of parallel events with entering the Jordan here and Rahab's similar Passover. Okay? Now, God through Moses insists that Israel remember all of these things. There are particular festivals that are set up yearly. They must celebrate the Passover yearly. They must celebrate the tabernacles yearly. Both of those events require pilgrimages to Jerusalem so that you will remember the way that God has operated through the incredible salvation event. Okay? Uh, so you got to travel back to Jerusalem and sit in a tabernacle. Oh, one other really important thing. Uh, in regards to tabernacles, you have a nice little tent on uh, your sheet there. Uh, God at Mount Sinai, uh, God's presence is, is uh, moving with him, leading them, but also begins to meet with Moses in the tent, very special and uniquely. And on Mount Sinai, much of the unfolding of the instructions in regards to worship and holiness are all surrounding the tabernacle. So God's presence has gone with them. He must be worshiped in the, the tabernacle is a tent that moves and goes with them. You must worship God at the tent, okay? And so when these festivals pop up and God insists that you go to Jerusalem to worship uh, at uh, Passover and at uh, the Feast of Booths, it's because God's tabernacle is now with them. Moses begins to do something really interesting for us at the end. Uh, well, in the Torah. And what he does is he begins to give us warnings That is, he tells us before they're ever in the land. Moses never went in the land. He tells us, hey, when you get to the land, you're not going to be able to stay in the land. You guys are going to mess this whole thing up. <laughs> he tells them. Leviticus 26. Okay. Oh, by the way, I forgot to reference this. My apologies. You have a ton of extracurricular activity. <laughs> If you so choose. Okay? These next passages that I'm about to refer to have all been written down for you. And I've even highlighted and underlined certain sections. I've given you little comments on the side. And then I copied the whole thing in color and stapled it for you. Trying to show you as if I'm sitting right next to you going, hey, look at this. Hey, look at this. Okay? So you can see this on this sheet, right? This is the only time you're allowed to look at this because I'm going to, I need your eyes up here in just a second. But you can see right here, Moses begins to give warnings while they're still in the wilderness wandering, saying, listen, you're going to get into the land, but can I tell you? You're not going to be able to keep it. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 4, 25 and 31. And heavily in those uh, five chapters in Deuteronomy 28 through 32. Here's what he says. You're going to get into the land. You're going to mess up. And eventually, you're going to be exiled. Here's how it happens. Uh, so it, it, let me give you the example of Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26 gives uh, blessings and warnings. If you get into the land and you keep the law and you do everything you're supposed to do, God's going to bless the socks off of you. It's going to be great. You won't believe how much God's going to bless you. In fact, the rest of the nations, here's the whole plan with Israel. The rest of the nations are going to see how much God is blessing you, and they're going to say, who is your God? I want that God. 
But if you get into the land and you do not do what you're supposed to, then God's going to begin to punish you and begin to bring curses upon you. It'll start out small, and then it's going to get larger, and it's going to get larger. And every time he gets a curse and he says, I'm going to, you, you will, he promises you will have rains in your season, but if you, if you get the curses side, you won't have rains in your season, and then the crops are going to start to dry up. And if that doesn't get your attention, this is how he writes, and if that doesn't get your attention, if you do not turn back to God, then I'll do this, and I'll allow your enemies to come in, and they will, they will conquer you, and, and they will have authority over you. And if that doesn't get your attention, and then this will happen. If that doesn't get your, if you do not turn back to God, then this will happen and then the final one after the a compound of all of these you're just like what is it going to take for them to finally listen to god he says then i will scatter you amongst the nations but then even then if you will turn back to me i will come and i will gather you and bring you back so what you see is that Moses begins to give us warnings before we've ever entered the land of how this is going to go. That there is going to be an exile and a second exodus. This has been promised from before they ever get into the land. Where we're going is they're going to be exiled into Babylon, and that's going to become second exodus. I need to pause real quick, and I need to show you some cool things. That there are patterns, repeated patterns in the scripture. You have charts for this. You are not allowed to look at the charts. You're only allowed to listen to me right now. You can go home. You can study your charts. By the way, I did this at lunch, and it was a complete train wreck. And mostly it was because like, I was referring to the charts, and then everyone was getting lost. So now I'm giving you specific instructions. Don't look. Go home. You look at the chart later. There was this man named Abraham from the land of Ur, who God called, by the way, Ur is in Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans. God called to him and said, hey, get up and go to the land that I will show you. So Abraham gets up and he goes to Haran. He pauses there, he spends a while, and then eventually... He continues and he moves on and he makes his way and he wanders around the land of Israel. Abraham is a, a, a shepherd. He's nomadic. And then he's there and he surveyed the land for a while. And then a famine occurs and he is forced to go to Egypt. Because of his sin... Because he would not be truthful with Pharaoh in regards to his wife, Pharaoh captures his wife. But God sends plagues upon the Pharaoh in order to free Sarah, his wife. Did you know what actually says that? Plagues early on upon Pharaoh so that Sarah is freed. And then Abraham makes it out of the land and comes back. But he actually came back richer than when he went in. He got a lot of plunder from Pharaoh through the process. A couple generations later, Abraham had a uh, grandson named Jacob who was also forced to leave the land mainly due to his trickery over his brother Esau. He's afraid Esau would kill him. He also needed to go and capture or get a wife and he was to go to uh, he was to go to his descendants and he goes to Haran. While he's at Haran, he's initially received with a warm welcome from his uncle Laban. 
But it's not too long before that warm welcome turns into hard labor from Laden. Jacob is multiplying greatly while he's there. But Laban doesn't like it and begins to get suspicious and begins to put restraints on him. God actually comes to Jacob and says, I have seen the way that Laban is afflicting you. And he brings him out. Laban hears about Jacob's exodus with all that plunder of all of those livestock, and he begins to chase him, to which God appears to Laban in a dream and tells him, don't do that. And Jacob comes up to Haran and actually comes back and takes the exact same path that Abraham, his grandfather, does back to the land. Patterns. Woven in repeated details because this ultimately becomes one of the key stories of the entire Bible. Now Moses gave warnings at the end of the Torah before they had ever entered the land. By the way, you're going to have to go into exile. As the time got nearer, and Israel was in the land, and they continued to be disobedient, prophets would rise up. I've given you a whole list of prophets. It's actually a short sampling because my time has been short this week in order to find different passages. But we'll just start with this. Hosea rises up as a prophet. Again, you have all of these passages underlined. Hey, look at what's happening here. And, and 200 years before the exile actually occurs... I want you to notice Hosea repeatedly uses exile language and exodus language. So the prophet warns an exile is coming, but then promises start to develop that a new exodus is coming. So as the prophets come, They began to speak of a new exodus. A new exodus is coming. Isaiah is a hundred years before the exile, is heavy in to new exodus terminology. In fact, Isaiah begins to, to prophesy and tell you that Israel is about to be cut down like, like a tree, completely cut down and burned. And he will tell you Babylon is coming. It'll be Assyria and then it'll be Babylon. And the city will be burned. There will be a purifying fire. He tells you that. But then, by the way, in the midst of that, once the tree is cut down and there's nothing but a burned stump left, i got good news. There's going to be a seed that comes up out of that stump, a holy seed, the root of Jesse that's going to rise up in the middle of that stump. And as you wade through the book of Isaiah and he talks about all this exile language and judgment is coming... Uh, that, that happens in, in 39, you get this movement, but it's, it's also filled with, and there's coming hope. So you're going to have an exodus, but, but, and, and you're going to go underneath the evil overlords of the kings, and you're going to be slaves. Why? Because of your sin. But there's, there's promise. There is this, this servant that begins to show up throughout the book of Isaiah. Jeremiah and Hosea, you get these glimpses, these promises of this one. And so you're supposed to look forward to it. And again, you have all those passages. But then the Old Testament, then the exile actually happens as you're reading the Old Testament, and suddenly it's very anticlimactic. Okay? Because the people, they're in, they're, they're in Babylon. 
because of their sin and they're captive for 70 years and they get to come back but when Ezra and Nehemiah come back and they rebuild the temple like they're they're greatly disappointed it's it's not nearly as glorious or as magnificent as this first waiver movement and it's it's like you know if you could have seen the first one you you would be crying at this one sort of deal and the spirit never re-enters the temple in the dramatic fashion that it does the tabernacle and the uh and, and the temple of solomon you don't get that you, you you're just left with this with this long period of silence and they may be back in the land and this exile happened and this new return happened. But when you read the prophets and as they tie to this new exodus, they have a lot more things tied to it than what actually occurs at the very end of the Old Testament. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Stick with me. You gotta wiggle around. It's about to get, it's about to become fire. You gotta get excited. 400 years of silence. The book of Matthew opens with genealogy. Ultimately, coming to a man named Joseph, whose father is Jacob. And by the way, he has dreams. And in Matthew 2, 7 through uh, 12, he has a dream and he is told to go to Egypt. You see, as they have a flight to Egypt, Matthew quotes a specific scripture passage that I've referenced you in your, ter uh, uh, in your things to look at. Out of Egypt I called my son. So Jesus appears, he's born in Israel to Joseph, whose father's Jacob, and Joseph has dreams, and Jesus goes to Egypt. Out of Egypt I called my son. Prophecy telling this and fulfilling this. Matthew 2, 16 through... Uh, that next little section, what's happening? Well, there's a story about Herod, the evil overlord, who is killing babies. But there's one who's rescued. Does that sound like anyone? So Jesus, who was born in Israel, was sent to Egypt, and suddenly the birth narrative is talking about how he escaped the evil overlord that's killing babies. As you continue through, uh, it gets deeper. I'll stay at the I'll stay at the higher level for you. Uh, and in John chapter three, the next scene is that John is baptizing, and John baptizes Jesus. What I want you to see here is he's baptizing Jesus in the Jordan. Hey, we have that. And this guy matches this guy right here. Jesus goes to Egypt, uh, has a similar birth story to Moses. And then the next thing that Matthew tells us is that he's being baptized in the Jordan. What's the next thing that happens after that? Yeah, he, go he goes, he goes. I mean, there are other details in there, skipping at the top. He goes 40 days in the wilderness. I could spend a whole, I could spend three sermons teaching you on what happens in the wilderness. Here's what happens in the wilderness. Every time Jesus is tempted, he responds from the same section in the book of Deuteronomy. Twice in Deuteronomy 6, once in Deuteronomy 8. It's all in your charts, okay? Why is he doing that? Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, what the book of Deuteronomy is, is Moses is summarizing. It's his farewell address. He's like, look, you knuckleheads back there, you should have done this. Okay? When you go, don't do that, don't do that again. Instead, respond like this. 
all three times in those temptations, after fasting and being in the wilderness for 40 days, Jesus responds to the same temptations that Israel had when they walked through the wilderness, but they failed. Jesus succeeds. Why? Because he's the true Israel. Hmm. Just like you and I fail, he succeeds. What happens after that? Jesus begins to start his ministry. And he begins to call his disciples. I've got a scripture passage for you to read in Jeremiah 16.10. Okay, I think that's where it is. Jeremiah, I know it's Jeremiah 16. Uh, if you read the Jeremiah 16 passage, it's incredible. Jeremiah, remember I told you the prophets keep talking about a new exodus is coming, a new exodus is coming. In that section, Jeremiah is talking about you're going to be spread out in Babylon, you're going to be scattered, but God is going to gather you, and in that gathering, you're going to be fishers of men, and then we're going to go back to the land. Did you know that? And Jesus begins to call his disciples, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Then Matthew chapter 5, what does he do? He ascends the mount and begins to teach. As the fulfillment of the law. And he begins to say, look, you've heard that it's been said, but I'm here to tell you. And he begins to unfold all the ways that he fulfills the law in areas pressing the law deeper and harder from external into our hearts and in other ways fulfilling the law and some of those ways that I showed you last time in terms of worship. And he is the fulfillment of all these things. And then after that, Matthew has 10 miracles of Jesus immediately following. Matthew chapters 8, 9, and 10. What is Matthew doing? He's screaming to us. The new Moses is here. Did you know in Deuteronomy, as Moses in his farewell address, he said, God is going to send a prophet like me who knows God face to face. And you're supposed to look for the prophet like Moses. And then Matthew narrates his entire gospel in this movement of Jesus coming to Egypt, coming out in the wilderness, right? And never failing, ascending the mount and with his mighty works because Matthew is screaming, the new Moses is here. And the new Exodus is here. John does something similar but different. And John... John articulates how Jesus, who stands in the temple and says, I am the temple, also shows up at all these festivals and says, by the way, all those festivals, they're all about me. I am the living water. I am the bread of life. I am the light. Because all of those festivals about what sustained them in the wilderness and, and the festivals, you had to repeat that and you had to include all of those elements. And then Jesus shows up at those elements and says, they're all about me. Why? Because, because God came and tabernacled. John 1, uh, 14, the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. And he is the man and he is the light and he is the water. He is the fulfillment of all of this. So we piece it all together as Christians we begin to see this typology and the pattern and the language that gets used over and over and over again. And it sounds like this. In my sin, I have been exiled from the land. I have been in bondage and I have been enslaved to my sin. There is an evil overlord. His name is Satan and his, and his demons who wish nothing but harm against me. But God has sent a true and greater Moses, a true and greater Israel, who accomplished it all on my behalf. Everywhere I failed, he succeeds. And he has come and he has saved me. He has delivered me. His 
Passover. We all know it is a picture of the death angel is coming because of my sin. But his blood on the doorpost of my heart is how it gets passed over. Salvation in his name. It's why we must celebrate the Passover. But we call it the Lord's Supper. We get to do it this Sunday. And Daniel's going to explain and unfold for us. The whole Passover is pointing to the Lord's Supper. It's a fulfillment. This is what's going on. So we would say, I'm dead in my sin. I'm enslaved in my sin. But Jesus, as the true Moses, the greater one, has given me a new exodus. But I am not home yet. I am in the wilderness. I still have trials. And life is still filled with difficulties. The Bible likes to pull in this idea. You are in Babylon. This world is not your home. But you ultimately long for the promised land. By the way, a land flowing with milk and honey. And has houses that you did not build. And cisterns that you did not dig. And vineyards that you did not plant. Doesn't that sound like what the Bible says heaven is? (laughs) You long for that. And and that you are an alien on this earth and that you, we, we describe this as Christians because it's the language of the Bible. That we are still in the wilderness. There are still trials and difficulties and part of the difficulty. But we have one who goes with us. The one who is our light. The one who is our living water. The one who is our bread. The one who sustains us. And he has promised to tabernacle with us all the way until the end. And the Exodus pattern is repeated and repeated and repeated. And it began in the very beginning in Eden. As they're kicked out because of their sin, the question is, are we ever going to get to go back? Hmm. And you go all the way to the end, and all of these threads meet together in one final spot, and we realize Our new Moses brings us back to Eden, the promised land, and heaven and earth become one. Hmm. These patterns repeated over and over and over again. It's the movement of the whole of Scripture. Do we have any time left? And that's why. All right, questions. We have a little bit of time left. Questions. I told you she's going to be drinking from a fire hose. Can I just say, this works. The job I'm doing for a 76 year old woman said, You sure are excited that you came from Bible study today? I said, Yes, I am. And she said, I gave up reading the Bible because I didn't understand it. And I said, Amen. 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 Okay, can I, if there's no questions, I mean, I've got you for 25 more minutes. Can I give you a five minute wiggle break? And then. If you come back, I want I want to show you even more amazing things because I've I've showed you the overall pattern. I've showed you an overall rhythm that occurs in Scripture. But now there are particular spots where you can begin to drill down. Did you know that Joseph is a type of Christ and that there are patterns that show up in Joseph's life? And you're like, oh, my goodness, that's about Jesus. And then with the Passover, we all know the Passover, that's a type. The New Testament teaches us that. But even when Abraham comes and goes back to the land, there's this type where Abraham goes up on the mountain with his son Isaac. There's a whole lot of parallels, a whole lot of exciting stuff there. And even though we're left here without, with wandering, where, where is this new Moses there, there is one character who rises to the top in a peculiar way. He doesn't end up leading us out of Babylon, okay? 
But I had you read Daniel chapter 6. You have these peculiar spots where if you start to drill down a little bit and you start to look at these things, you begin to see patterns and types that are magnificent. Because this is how God has prophesied and fulfilled himself. They're not trite patterns. They're magnificent details. That if you read Daniel chapter 6, Daniel in the lion's den, you've probably read it to your children, you've read it in children's Bibles and those sorts of things, and you've glossed over it and you've said, oh, this is a cute story. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give you five minutes to wiggle. If you want to come back, you don't have to. I know uh, it, there's a lot. But if you come back in those, uh, those 15 minutes left, I'll give you some exciting Daniel 6. And then we're done. All right, here we go. It must be 
Alright, this this is the bonus. Alright. Bonus round. You guys are getting your money's worth, alright? It's worth worth the price of admission tonight, okay? Uh, Daniel chapter six. So one of the things I want to show you is there are particular points within the scripture uh, where because the stories are repeated, where you can begin to see typologies or patterns, details about Christ, these themes and the patterns, they pop up. Uh, it's one of the, the most fun things uh, that I've done over the past, I don't know, eight years in reading the Bible and, and trying to figure some of these things out. Uh, because it is the way that God does predictive things. But the way that God predicts, I told you guys this on Sunday if you were there. The Bible doesn't predict and say, hey, his name's going to be Judas. Uh, and he's going to betray Jesus, right? It doesn't do it that way. It does it in different in different patterns, okay? Um, so, Daniel 6, Daniel, the story of Daniel and the lion's den is a typology of Jesus, okay? Uh, if, we, if I had a full hour, I would do a lot of teasing and let you guys figure it out yourself. The way I normally teach this is we read sections, and I tell you to tell me when to stop. All right, so we'll just read, and you say, stop, and then we talk about, like, how it's a type. We don't have that time. We've got roughly 10 minutes left, so I'll do it all myself, but I want you to... Uh, I want you to be able to go home, get excited about the scripture. Let me reference one thing for you. Uh, this is the best little Bible I've ever seen to read to your kids and grandkids. Because the same way I showed you the video, how the Bible is one continuous story that's always pointing to Jesus, that's what this does. It's called the Jesus Storybook Bible. Okay? Um, I was thinking somehow I'd do a raffle for one of you who wants to read it to your grandkids, but I didn't get that far, so I have no clue. I'll set it right here, and I don't know. We'll figure it out. One of you can have it, okay? Daniel 6, here we go. Uh, it seemed good for Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom, uh, and over them three commanders, of whom Daniel was one. Of these satraps, uh, sorry, that these satraps might be accountable to them, and that the king might not suffer loss. Then Daniel began to distinguish himself among the commissioners and satraps, because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. It's very common in, uh, uh, there's a very common pattern in Old Testament typology that happens uh, a number of times. And that is that the king, the guy who is king, wants to find a number two guy and give the entire kingdom over to that number two. Someone tell me other spots where that occurs. Joseph. Joseph. There's one other really prominent one. Moses. Now, Pharaoh never wants to give it to Moses. It's Esther and Mordecai. If you watch and you follow, Mordecai follows the same pattern. Esther is the one that's the catalyst, but at the very end, Mordecai is lifted up as the number two. And here, Daniel is lifted up as the number two. What's interesting in this typology and pattern is that the king always wants to disappear into the background and he wants to give complete jurisdiction and authority over to the number two. He does not mind the exaltation of the number two. Look at my number two. Worship the God of the number two. It's the way all three of these patterns go at the end. What is it pointing to? Jesus. That's right, that's always the answer, isn't it? The God the Father in the Holy Trinity is going to send his Son. And he's going to give all authority, all kingdom, 
such that everyone will bow down to the number two. And God will work to make all of his enemies a footstool for his feet and plant them underneath him. And all will know who the number two is. Then the number two will give it back to the number one and eternity will begin. Daniel has an extraordinary spirit. That's very unusual language for the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit is upon him in a unique way, causing him to be singul singled out amongst the other leaders. Do the other leaders like this aspect no. of Daniel? No. In fact, they're very furious about that. The king is recognizing you. The king is looking upon you. We don't like it. What's that sound like? A lot of jealousy. In the New Testament, the typology is the fact that all the leaders, when the Son of God comes, they don't like him. They don't like him one bit. Because the king likes him. Oh, the king's given you authority. Why are you get the authority? We want the authority. And so immediately they begin to plot against him. Uh, that was the end of verse 3. Wanted to point over him the entire kingdom. So the commissioner, Satraps, uh, began uh, trying to find ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to the government affairs, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Really, they, they tried to throw anything they could at him and nothing would stick? What does that sound like? That's right. <laughs> Then the man said that we will not find any ground of accusation against the standing unless we find it against him in regard to the law of his God. So they begin to develop a plot. And that is, King Darius live forever. Uh, no one's allowed to pray to anyone but you. That's how it unfolds. Hold on. For 30 days, no one's allowed to pray to anyone but you. So establish the injunction. Okay? And it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians. So it's signed into document. Now, uh, verse 10. Daniel knew that the document was signed. But he still, in his faithfulness, entered his house uh, with his windows towards Jerusalem on his roof changer. And he continued kneeling upon his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks to his God as he had been previously doing Where's Jesus going to be finally captured? Praying. Praying in the garden. Was that the first time he had ever prayed in the garden? No, that was actually his regular praying spot. That's how they knew to go capture him there. And the men came by agreement. They found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. And then they approached him, spoke to the king about it, said, hey, you got to throw him in jail. This is the law that is held against him. Okay, skipping down quickly. All right. Verse 14. Then as soon as the king began to hear the statement, he was deeply distressed, and he set his mind on delivering Daniel. And that even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. Who does that sound like? That sounds like Pilate. Yeah, doing everything he can. Twisting and turning and squirming washing his hands, trying to rescue him. But the men come and say, listen, there is an injunction against him. The law must be held. The law must be held. I showed you uh, before, earlier, that um, God the Father, that the first part, the king wants to hand over all authority to the number two because God the Father wants to do so with the, th with the Son. I've meditated on this scripture passage uh, a lot through the years and thought mightily about the fact that the law must be held. And it doesn't matter that the king wishes all that he wants or might for Daniel to be let free because the law must be held. It is the law of the Medes and the Persians. And from an eternal perspective, it is the eternal law of God, his holiness. It cannot be thwarted. It doesn't matter how much he wishes or wanted for Jesus to simply be set free. 
It doesn't work that way. Then the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God, you can, you can hear how the king is on Daniel's side, Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet ring of his nobles so that nothing could be changed in regards to Daniel. You ever seen this before? Sealed by the king. Nothing can be done in regards to the pit of death. Roll a stone, sealed by the king. Then the king arose at dawn, at the break of day, and went in haste to the lion's den. And when he came near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said, Daniel! Servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? And the women arose early on the first day of the week at dawn, not knowing what they were going to. They went with troubled spirits. King Darius went with hope and expectation. Daniel, has your God been able to save you from the pit of death? There is no God who could do that, but maybe your God could. Sorry, my page flipped and all my yelling. <laughs> Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me inasmuch as I have been found innocent before him. I've been found innocent before God. Therefore, I come out of the pit. O king, I have committed no crime. Then the king was very pleased and gave order for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. And so Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatsoever was found upon him because he trusted in his God. And then the king gave orders and they brought all those men who had maliciously accused Daniel and they cast them and their children and their wives into the lion's den. And they did not reach the bottom of the den before the lion overpowered them and crushed all their bones. That part usually gets left out in the children's story. <laughs> <laughs> Now listen to this ending, because it's magnificent. Then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language. The commission goes out to every man, tribe, tongue, and nation who are living in all the land. May your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and to tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed and his dominion will be forever. For he delivers and he rescues and he performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Who could do that? And so this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And it is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ that is foretold in signs and patterns and stories, not in trite manners, but woven in details so that when you see it, you can't unsee it. 
when you see how God is working in time and space and history and weaving and unfolding it all. And at the end of the story, it's this good news must go throughout the land. Every tribe, tongue, nation must hear about this God. And you and I read it and we're like, that happened 400 years before Jesus ever came. And you see it and it's woven in history. How could you not believe in a God who writes all of history and weaves it together in intricate, magnificent details that you cannot make up, that you don't even see it always the first time. But then you start to dig and you start to say, you know why it matters here? You know why Daniel's here? Because they were looking at the new Exodus and you're asking the question, is there a new Moses who's attached with that new Exodus? And you can look right here at the Passover and you look at Abraham and Isaac and I can do the same thing with that story and you would suddenly see magnificent and details about they go to Jerusalem to the temple mount and that's where he walks up the temple Isaiah carrying his own wood and lays his life down on the altar and God says all right I'll provide the sacrifice all of this woven together intricate details magnificent and it's all in your Bible and they're not children's stories there are typological patterns repeated over and over again, pointing you to the fact that Jesus is coming. And he has come. And we see the full picture. All right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we love you. We love your word. Your word excites us to see your hand in history and how it has been preserved for us. And then to see it unfold in magnificent patterns. It's beautiful. Because you are beautiful. You are a God who saves. You are a God who reaches into history. And you are a God who is so detailed that you, you will weave these sorts of magnificent things for us to see and to just marvel at your hand. We love you. We thank you. Stir up our faith. Help us to walk out in obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.